Welcome to Anambra Anglican Parish Online. My name is Ralph Bowles. I'm the minister in charge of this parish. And I want to welcome you wherever you are in the world, joining us online uh, in this act of worship this morning. Particular welcome to all those who would normally be here physically in one of our buildings, in one of our congregations in this part of Queensland. It's a strange time. We're not able to meet together uh, physically, but let's remind ourselves today as we join together in this act of worship that we are one in the spirit through Christ as a fellowship of Christ's people, one with each other and with all Christ's people around the world. May this act of worship today uh, lift your hearts as we're all lifted up to the throne of God together in prayer and praise. Let me pray. Gracious God, make this time of worship a rich time of spiritual renewal for all of us. Amen. Welcome to our service this morning. My name is Coral McVean and I am a member of St John's Nambour Anglican Church. Let us praise and give thanksgiving to God. Make a joyful noise to God all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to God glorious praise and say how awesome are your deeds. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honour and glory and praise. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom and as you sing psalms, hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Gracious God, we humbly thank you for life and health and safety, for freedom to work, leisure to rest, and for all that is beautiful in creation and human life. But above all, we praise you for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for the gift of your spirit and for the hope of sharing in your glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Heroes and conquerors 
Let us hear the ministry of the word. Thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us and showing a way of salvation through faith in your Son. We ask you now to teach and encourage us through your word so that we may be ready to serve you for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. The first reading is 1 Peter chapter 1, reading verses 13 to 25. Therefore, with minds that are alert and fully sober, set your hope of the grace to be brought to you when Jesus Christ is revealed at his coming. As obedient children, do not conform to evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. But just as he who called you is holy, so be holy in all you do. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. Since you call on the Father who judges each person's work impartially, live out your time as foreigners here in reverent fear. For you know that it is not with perishable things such as silver or gold that you were redeemed from the empty way of life handed down to you from your ancestors, but with the precious blood of Christ, a lamb without blemish or defect. He was chosen before the creation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for your sake. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and glorified him, and so your faith and hope are in God. Now that you have purified yourselves by obeying the truth, so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. For you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all people are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, and the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this is the word that was preached to you. Hear the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. The Gospel of our Lord according to Luke chapter 24, reading verses 13 to 35. Now that same day, two of them were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. They were kept from recognising him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them named Cleopas asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed, before God and all the people. The chief priests and the rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. Then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but they did not see Jesus. This is the gospel of our Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to, to God. God. Let us affirm our faith. We, we believe in one God who made and loves all that is. We, we believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was born, lived, died and rose again and is coming to call all to account. We believe in the Holy Spirit, who calls, equips, and sends out God's people and brings all things to their true end. This is our faith, the faith of the Church. We believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
We are still in the Easter season, and this is the third Sunday in the season, season of Easter. And so we, uh, our, we are going to continue to explore the resurrection, and our reading for today from the Gospel reading from chapter 24 of Luke continues with the eyewitness testimony of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. As I said the other week at Easter Day, the Christian faith is not uh, merely a philosophical theory. It has its philosophical dimension, of course, but it is grounded in a story, an event, a narrative, the events of history. And it sits on top of those witnesses, of original witnesses of history. So we're going to look at one of them today. Uh, in a passage from Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35, the, the story of the road to Emmaus, appearance of Jesus. This is uh, regarded by many as one of the most vivid narratives in the whole Bible. Now, I know that novelists can create vivid narratives, but generally speaking, this has all the earmarks of an original eyewitness. So let's look at it here in Luke chapter 24, verses 13 to 35. The resurrection of Jesus was a, an earth-shaking and transformative event for the people who were the original witnesses, and we stand on their shoulders and their witness. There are six uh, elements in this account that stand out. Let me just take you through them. First is the identity of the two men. We read that on that same day, on the afternoon of the resurrection day, two, two men were going to a village called... Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about what, everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing, recognizing him. And one of them was named Cleopas. Verse 18. Let me just talk to you about the identity of these men, first of all. Cleopas. When a person is named in the scriptures, particularly in documents that were probably published while uh, those people were around, they're usually uh, regarded as significant witnesses. Now, this man, Cleopas, could very likely be the same man who is called Clopas, slightly different spelling, and he, in the Gospels, is the husband of a woman called Mary, who is one of the women who stood by the cross of Jesus and watched the burial of Jesus and came with the other women early to the tomb um, uh, to anoint Jesus and herself saw the risen Lord. She's called in the other Gospel accounts the other Mary. Mary was a common name. Now, Mary and Clopas had two sons, James and Joseph. This younger James, as he's called, may have been one of Jesus' own disciples. Later church tradition named Cleopas as the brother of Joseph, Jesus' earthly father. So this Clopas, or Cleopas, on the road to Emmaus may have been Jesus' uncle. He certainly appears to have been someone close into the connection with the early circles around Jesus. Closely interested, therefore, in the fortunes and career of Jesus of Nazareth. The other travelling companion of Cleopas on the road to Emmaus is an unnamed man. And it's interesting that he is not named, but Cleopas is. The suggestion has often been made down the centuries that each of the Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, uh, included himself in the story because they were in the story, but did so by rendering themself, themselves unnamed. Rather like a famous author, a painter's put paint a picture and put their signature in the corner um, just to indicate that this was their signature, this was their painting. So, for example, Mark was a young man who fled in the night of the betrayal in the garden. Um, John, widely regarded to be the disciple whom Jesus loved. Matthew, who is one of the disciples, the tax collector. We, d we can't be sure of this, but it's possible, and it's been suggested for a long time, that Luke himself, the author of this gospel, may have been the unnamed disciple, the unnamed companion on the road to Emmaus. Certainly it would explain the vivid the vividness of this narrative, whether it came to us from Luke, 
an unnamed witness, or from Cleopas himself, telling Luke, the gospel writer, we don't know. And they were talking as they walked along the road about everything that had happened, the dramatic events of recent days. The second feature of this account is the mysterious stranger who joins them on the road, verses 14 and following, down to verses 16 and verse 31. The mysterious stranger. It seems to be a characteristic of the early resurrection narratives that Jesus was not, on some occasions, immediately recognised in, in his resurrected state. Um, we know that in John's Gospel for Mary in the Garden, uh, we know the eleven in the upper room were not sure, and even the disciples in Galilee in the fishing boat didn't immediately recognise Jesus when he appeared near them. It may have been due to some change in the physical appearance of Jesus in the resurrection. We don't know. There, the New Testament does teach that there was a both a continuity between the resurrection of Jesus, the resurrected Jesus, and his previous uh, mortal li uh, life before his death and resurrection. And there is a discontinuity, his body operating slightly differently. It's an interesting little um, uh, truth about the resurrection seen in passing in the narratives. It, it, unless the, uh, this is a made-up thing, which is very strange, if it's, if it's true, then it's a strange invention if someone was to make it up. Because why would you, to convince people of the truth of the resurrection, introduce a doubt into the narrative by having him having the character of Jesus not recognised. So it has the ring of truth about it because it, it's hard to imagine why people would have invented uh, s such an idea. The third feature of the narrative is that is the recap of all the things that had happened in the recent days. Um, when uh, Jesus, the unknown this, um, companion on the road, asked them, what are you talking about? As you walk along the road, what's this intense discussion about? They stood still, their faces downcast, we read. And Clopas asked him, Cleopas asked him, Are you the only person in Jerusalem who doesn't know what's happened in these recent days? What things? asked Jesus. What things? And then they tell him about Jesus of Nazareth, they replied, a prophet powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death, and they crucified him. But he had hope, he, but we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. What is more, it is the third day since it all took place. And in addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early this morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us they had seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb, found it just as the women had said, but they, him they did not see. In other words, they're still puzzled by the turbulent events, both of tragedy and the death of Jesus, and now the strange story that he's alive again. This was the talk of Jerusalem, the rise and tragic end of Jesus. And now, amongst the uh, group of them, the, the apparent news that he was not dead anymore. And they thought that he was more than a prophet that he was actually going to be the Messiah, the one to redeem Israel. He had proclaimed the coming of the kingdom of God and they put their hopes in him. And now their hopes had been dashed and now were being raised again. And he'd been three days in the grave. And uh, it was very serious. You can understand their consternation. The startling news that had been spreading that day had now confused them further. And no doubt, no wonder they were talking about it that afternoon. It was the big news story of the day. I once sat near at work a man who was a communications officer and uh, he would always have the story of the day on the news, you know, the interesting or dramatic or funny story of the day. Well, the, the death of Jesus and now the resurrection, the resurrection rumours were the story of the day for Cleopas and his friend. The fourth element is just to recap the story of that day. They go through it, and I'd like to just recap them with you, the events of that day, um, as you put together the pieces of the, of the various gospel accounts. Remember that early on Sunday morning, Jesus came back to life at the tomb. An earthquake had happened. 
The angel, angel rolled away the stone, we read, and frightened away the Roman guards that were there. Several of the women arrive early now on the day after the Sabbath to anoint the body. The other Mary, Cleopas's wife, Salome, the wife of Zebedee, Mary Magdalene, they come along with other women that morning. They see no angel. They find the stone moved away and no body in the tomb. Mary Magdalene immediately returns to tell Peter and John that the body had been removed. And then the other women stay behind and they encounter an angel, a young man, who tells them that Jesus is alive, instructs them to tell the disciples he's going to meet them in Galilee. So the women return to the city completely emotionally overawed by the situation. At this same time that they leave, another group of women, coming from a different part of the city, arrive at the tomb. We know some of them, Joanna and another woman from Galilee. They too see the stone moved and the body gone, but this time they meet two men in dazzling apparel. They receive a similar message from the angels about, uh, about uh, Jesus coming to Galilee and they leave to return to retell the disciples. Together with Mary Magdalene and the other woman, women, Joanna and her friend rendezvous with the disciples in the city. The disciples did not at first believe what the women were telling them. Now, the, the, Emmaus, the Emmaus men had heard by this time that there had been meetings with Jesus himself, um, but they hadn't seen him. The women had, but the disciples had not. And then we come to the first appearances that afternoon. Peter and John ran to the tomb. They found it empty. They leave and tell the disciples. Mary Magdalene returns to the tomb and in her grief actually meets Jesus after seeing two, two men in white in the tomb. So early Sunday morning, um, sorry, by the time we get to early Sunday afternoon when these men in, in the, are rock working on the road to Emmaus, um, there was much to talk about. The fifth element in this story is the interpretation of the Messiah that they have. Jesus, uh, their companion on the road, takes up their disappointment in what had happened to him to Jesus, and he teaches them about the background and interpretation about the Messiah, of the events that were unfolding around them. He gives them a lesson in biblical theology and the gospel. And if you think these men were slow to catch on, uh, well, think about yourself. I think of myself. And many people have heard the message of Christ for many years and have just not got through to them about what, this, how, what it meant and the significance of it. Uh, we can be very thick indeed when it comes to spiritual truths. Uh, we're very set in our traditional understandings and ways of thinking about things. We don't give up our cherished ideologies or prejudices easily uh, as human beings. So Jesus takes them through the scriptures. He, um, he says, Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. What a lesson in biblical theology those men received that afternoon from none other than Jesus Christ himself, the risen Jesus. Reinterpreting for them the cross. So there was no longer a tragedy, but it was a victory. This is the wonderful change that the New Testament brings. The cross seen as the greatest victory of God, not the greatest defeat of God's, uh, God's Messiah, but the greatest victory. Not a sign of, of evil, but of the triumph of evil. Um, you have to read the New Testament and realise these early Christians, these early Jewish followers of Jesus, went through a complete transformation of their thinking. As Jesus and then Paul and others drew out of the, the, the old covenants, the first covenant scriptures, the deeper meaning of these events. And then the sixth and final uh, feature of this account that I want to note today is the recognition of the Saviour that happened. Uh, they asked this stranger, this fascinating stranger, who's explained so many things to them, to stay with them, join them for dinner in hosp hospitality. They urged him to, uh, to stay. He looked like he was going to keep going. And I said, no, you stay with us, please. It's nearly evening. The day is almost over. Come and have dinner with us. And while he was at table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to them. And then their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he disappeared from their sight. 
Now, it was the truth of the Lord's interpretation that had prepared their minds and started to free them from their misunderstandings when he spoke to them of the Messiah's death and so on and how it had to happen. But uh, it was when he broke bread with them. We don't know what it was. Was it his actions or his words that all of a sudden took the veil from their eyes and they could understand that this was Jesus, after all, with them? It's a fact about human psychology, and we're all of us um, prone to it, that we see what we expect to see, and what we don't expect to see, we don't often see. And these men did not expect to see Jesus. Uh, that at least is one partial psychological explanation of their failure to recognise him. But perhaps there was a spiritual thing involved here, and that, there, that God had opened their eyes at the moment they were ready to see him in a new light ready now to understand him differently, then God enabled them to see. This moment of recognition came after all that preparation. When they sat at table, he did something so familiar to them that they recognised him. And then their famous words, wonderful verse, were, they asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? Burning with an excitement with a thrill of understanding of God speaking deep into their hearts. This is a wonderful verse. And I wonder whether you resonate with that yourself. Does your heart burn with excitement about the things in the scriptures, about the Saviour when you hear them, when you read them, when you listen to them, when you understand them afresh? It's a wonderful thing about reading the scriptures, about hearing the gospel story again, is that even though it's very, very familiar to you, to you, to one, uh, every now and again you read it and it catches fire again and you see a deeper level of it. It comes home to your mind and heart in a fresh way. Uh, and you didn't think it was possible that such a familiar message could become so powerfully alive again with, with, with the fire of God. This is what uh, happened to these men. The final scene, of course, in the story is they get up immediately after Jesus had left them, and returned to Jerusalem and find the eleven there uh, and those with them. There are others there too. And they say, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognised by them when he broke the bread. So when... Um, When they got back to see the eleven, they found out that Jesus indeed was had revealed himself to the disciples, and Simon Peter had seen him. And then they tell them their story. So the the narrative builds, and the witnessing continues to to be shared. <clears throat> so it's um, Luke brings that story um, to a crisis in the next section, which we didn't read, when Jesus himself stands among them, all of them now, in a, in another scene of. Of, uh, of revelation uh, he comes and stands with them so this is the story we have from our, for us today one of the many eyewitnesses of the resurrection story of Jesus and we believe, I believe that this gospel was published within the 20 or 30 years after the resurrection it was circulating while these people were probably still alive or people that heard them were still alive telling the story about it um, so some things just to point to in conclusion. We, we see and believe in the resurrection of Jesus because of the evidence of eyewitnesses who were there at the time. And certainly people can doubt them. Many people have, but you know people can doubt anything, even events that many other people see. The fact that people are sceptical of these events and doubt them doesn't shake their reality, their reality and their grounding in history. There is good grounds to believe them. And uh, the fact that the Old Testament was fulfilled with Jesus, that there was a unity in the Bible revealing and uh, preparing for the way. May uh, the presence of the risen Christ and the understanding of the gospel be refreshed for you and me this Easter, this Easter season so that our hearts burn within us when we hear this story again and we understand the scriptures in a deeper way. Amen. Let us confess our sins to our Heavenly Father. 
Let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let us now confess our sins to Almighty God. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have broken your holy laws and have left undone what we ought to have done. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Christ died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. God desires that none should perish, but that all should turn to Christ and live. In response to his call, we acknowledge our sins. God pardons those who humbly repent and truly believe the gospel. And therefore we have peace with God through Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And let us say our Lord's Prayer together. Our, our Father, Father in heaven, heaven Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial, and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Dear Jesus, our Lord, by submitting to death, you conquered the grave. By being lifted upon the cross, you draw all peoples to you. By being raised from the dead, you restore to humanity all that was lost through sin. Be with us in your risen power, that in word and deed we may proclaim the marvellous mystery of death and resurrection. For all praise is yours, now and throughout eternity. Almighty God, we pray for world leaders and their people, for justice and peace in all the challenges that they face. And we pray that Christian leaders will seek your guidance for their decisions. We pray particularly for our Australian leaders and their parliaments. Encourage them to seek your guidance in their decisions. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we do pray for our church leaders. We pray particularly for Archbishop Philip, Bishop Jeremy, and our own priests, Reverend Ralph, Father Philip, and Father John. And we thank you for them, Lord. Bless them with your peace joy and love and we pray for all Christians wherever they are meeting today Lord and glorifying your name strengthen us to want to spend more time reading your word and listening to what you are saying to us and today we particularly pray for our congregations and their families at St Margaret's St John's and all saints and we pray at this time of social distancing that we will all still feel connected to our families and church families and we pray for those working in our health industries lord in your mercy hear yeah. our prayer and we pray for those who are struggling physically financially emotionally mentally, spiritually. Strengthen us, Lord, to hand over all of our concerns to you. And we pray for healing, for peace and increased faith. And we thank you 
and we pray for those who care for the people who are in need. Lord, in your mercy, hear yeah. our prayer. And we thank you, Father, for all your servants in every age. Grant that we, with all your saints, may be brought to a joyful resurrection and the fulfilment of your kingdom. Thank you, Father, for hearing our prayers and grant that what we have asked in faith we may, by your grace, receive. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Now, friends, uh, if you haven't already done so, I invite you perhaps to uh, for just take a minute and to get some wine or juice and some bread perhaps, something simple, and we'll do together an act of spiritual communion and thanksgiving. So we invite you to join in a simple act of eating some bread or drinking some wine or juice as we give thanks for the salvation Christ has won for us in his death and resurrection. We'll just wait for a minute or so for you to get those things together if you haven't got them ready, and then we'll move forward with this spiritual communion.
The Lord be with you and also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Loving God in union with Christians throughout the world, we offer you praise and thanksgiving today. Even though we are unable to eat and drink the Lord's Supper together, we rejoice in our union with Christ and his body through the Spirit and rest in his saving gift of life. Amen. We invite you to join together, though we are separated, in a joint act of eating and drinking in thanksgiving for the Lord's Supper, for what Christ has done for us in his life, death and resurrection, the salvation he's won for us in, Christ, in his uh, work, great work. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, St Paul reminds us of the significance of the Lord's Supper. The Lord Jesus, he said, on the night he was betrayed, took bread when he had given you thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Lord be with you. And also. Lift up your hearts, loving God, in union with Christians throughout the world. We offer you praise and thanksgiving today. And even though we are unable to eat and drink the Lord's Supper together, we rejoice in our union with Christ and his body through the Spirit. And we rest in his saving gift of life. Let us eat and drink together. Amen. Loving God, we thank you for hearing our prayers, feeding us with your word and encouraging us in our meeting together. Take us and use us to love and serve you and all people in the power of your spirit and in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And thank you to those people who have been online with us today. I pray that each one of you will be blessed by your attendance here. May the God of peace equip you with everything good for doing his will, working in you what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen.
Come on. 